France, Europe, the Christian world reeling over the brutal throat cutting of a Catholic priest during Mass in France by members of ISIS. We'll talk about that and we're going to play the balance of Michelle Obama's speech at the DNC. I'm committed to giving equal time. I'll be right back. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Here's your host, Randall Terry. If you've been listening to the campaign of Hillary and the DNC convention, you know that they are committed to not talking about Islamic terrorism. And on night one, there was not a single mention of ISIS or Islamic terrorism. Then, of course, the morning after, yesterday, we had the brutal murder, the execution of the priest in his Catholic parish in Normandy, France, Father Jacques Hamel, 84 years old, killed while it was filmed, parishioners in there screaming, crying. This is the fruit of 1,400 years of Islamic terrorism. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. If you're Roman Catholic, if you're Roman Catholic, who was the first pope? If you're Protestant and you don't know the answer to that, you're going to learn something. Who was the one, I'll say it in Protestant terms, who was the one who Jesus appointed as the leader, the pastor, head pastor? Peter. Right. In other words, whether we're evangelical and we study our Bible or we're Roman Catholic and we study church history and the dogmas of the church, we know the, the most important stories. What was the first miracle that happened? It was Jesus changing water into wine. Okay, John chapter 2. We know our stories. They form us. They form our religion. They form our consciences. They give us examples that we should strive to mimic. Muslims have those. So let me ask you a question. Who's the first caliph? Caliph? What's a caliph? Well, a caliph, khalifa, is an Arabic word and it means successor. A successor. Muhammad, according to the Islamic scheme, was the last prophet, the seal of the prophets. Between Christ and him, that was it, and then there will be no more prophets after him. Now, he had a successor that was in charge of the military, of the body politic, of the religious aspects of the Muslim faith, but he was not a successor in the prophetic office, okay? So it's not another prophet, it's just a successor of his political and military authority. That's what caliph means, okay? So when the Muslim terrorists drove the bus in France that killed all those people, ISIS immediately released a statement saying that no one would be safe until the caliph was restored and the lands of the caliph, the successor, were back in the hands of Muslims. This is their goal. This is their storyline. Now, we know our storyline, but if we're going to win this war, we've got to know certain highlights, lowlights of their storyline. So again, I ask you, who is the first caliph? You need to know. You've got to study this. Go online, go to the library, get a book. All right, fine, I'll tell you. His name was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was probably Muhammad's closest friend. Abu Bakr was the dad, the father of Aisha. Aisha was the child bride who Muhammad married when she was five or six years old and then consummated the marriage with her when she was nine. Okay, this is a prepubescent little girl, all right? So Abu Bakr was her dad. He was the first caliph, the first successor. After Muhammad died, most of the Arabian Peninsula left the Muslim faith. They said, he's dead, that's over. And Abu Bakr, the first successor, said, oh no, you committed to follow Muhammad and his religion and you're going to stay in it or we're going to kill you. And, they, and Abu Bakr launched the bloody apostasy wars 
to bring Arabia back into the fold, to keep to bring people back into allegiance to Islam. So the caliph of ISIS, the man who said, I'm the caliph. By the way, the caliph, the caliph was abolished in 1924 by Camille Ataturk. From Muhammad's death until 1924, there had been a caliph. Be like, there's a pope, right? They just keep having popes. There's gonna be another one. That's the way the Catholic Church works. So if a guy dies, don't worry, in a few weeks, there'll be another pope. Well, the caliph was the same way, successor, 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 until it was abolished in 1924. And the Muslims, like Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, and other Muslim terrorists that emerged from that have said, no, 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 we've got to have a caliph. So Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the guy in charge of ISIS, says, I'll be him. I'll be the next caliph. And he picked the name Abu Bakr because that was the first caliph after Muhammad. That was the caliph that launched the apostasy wars. So this guy, this head of ISIS, this bloodthirsty murderer, this demon-possessed evildoer, is reading these Muslim stories and saying, hmm, we need a caliph. We need one to stop apostasy. We need one to reunite all the Muslims together. Well, who better to name myself after than the first guy who did that, Abu Bakr. So I'll pick his name. My name is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi to Baghdad, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna restore the caliphate in me and there'll be someone after me. If I get killed, we're gonna have a guy in line that's gonna be the next one. We're gonna start this whole succession thing all over again. That's what they're after, friend. That's their storyline. That's one itty bitty storyline out of Islamic terrorism that is anchored squarely in ancient Muslim history. They're just mimicking the, right, the readings and the writings of the first generation of Muslims. So if we're gonna understand what we've got to deal with, then we're going to have to read their literature and we're gonna have to profile based upon what they're reading. If the law enforcement authorities just wanna check out if the guy is reading about the murders, the hadiths that talk about beheading people, the ones who talk about killing, kill any Jew that falls into your power, just go down the list. If they're doing that, then you know we've got a problem. I've gotta take a break. We'll be right back. We're gonna play some of Michelle Obama's speech. Don't go away. If you own a business and would like to advertise on our program, please contact us. We are currently seen on over 130 television stations from coast to coast. We air at 8 p.m. Eastern, and then all times are local. We have a lot of reach, friend, and this is an opportunity at a great price for you to get your product or your service in front of hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people. Also, if there's something that's important to you and you'd like to have a month where you just say thank you to this ministry or promote a certain ministry or a certain cause, contact us. Our rates are incredibly affordable. You'd be surprised. And you, again, can reach into hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of homes. We're currently seen in possibly in over 30 million homes. So give us a call, give us an email, and we'll put a commercial up for you. If you are following the DNC convention, you know that unity has been a big problem because of all these emails that came out where clearly there was perhaps criminal activity going on. And I'm talking about saying, well, we can appoint people to federal office who give this amount of money or give a lot of money or raise a lot of money. In other words, we're buying and selling federal positions. Doesn't that sound like a crime to someone? But I digress. Elizabeth Warren's speech was off the rails bad. But Michelle Obama, her speech was political genius. Political genius. And we played some of it for you last night. In these next three segments, we're gonna play the entire remainder of the speech. I don't care for Michelle Obama. I don't like her, but this speech was brilliant. You judge for yourself. Kids like the little black boy who looked up at my husband, his eyes wide with hope, and he wondered, is my hair like yours? And make no mistake about it, this November when we go to the polls, that is what we're deciding. 
not Democrat or Republican, not left or right. No, in this election and every election is about who will have the power to shape our children for the next four or eight years of their lives. And I, I am here tonight because in this election, there is only one person who I trust with that responsibility. Only one person who I believe is truly qualified to be President of the United States, and that is our friend Hillary Clinton. Hillary to lead this country because I've seen her lifelong devotion to our nation's children. Not just her own daughter, who she has raised to perfection, but, but every child who needs a champion. Kids who take the long way to school to avoid the gangs. Kids who wonder how they'll ever afford college. Kids whose parents don't speak a word of English but dream of a better life. Kids who look to us to determine who and what they can be. You see, Hillary has spent decades doing the relentless, thankless work to actually make a difference in their lives. Advocating for kids with disabilities as a young lawyer, fighting for children's health care as First Lady, and for quality child care in the Senate. And when she didn't win the nomination eight years ago, she didn't get angry or disillusioned. She, Hillary did not, Hillary did not pack up and go home. Because as a true public servant, Hillary knows that this is so much bigger than her own desires and disappointments. So she proudly stepped up to serve our country once again as Secretary of State, traveling the globe to keep our kids safe. And look, there were plenty of moments when Hillary could have decided that this work was too hard that the price of public service was too high, that she was tired of being picked apart for how she looks or how she talks or even how she laughs. But here's the thing. What I admire most about Hillary is that she never buckles under pressure. She, she never takes the easy way out. And Hillary Clinton has never quit on anything in her life. And when I think about the kind of president that I want for my girls and all our children, that's what I want. I want someone with the proven strength to persevere, someone who knows this job and takes it seriously, someone who understands that the issues a president faces are not black and white and cannot be boiled down to 140 characters. Look, because. Because when, when you have the nuclear codes at your fingertips and the military in your command, you can't make snap decisions. I'll be right back, friend. We're going to play Michelle Obama's speech in its entirety. Let me tell you when I come back what they said about her. Don't go away. Friend, this program is supported by friends like you who believe in what we are doing. We run a very tight ship. 
Thankfully, we are on over 130 stations across the country having tremendous impact. We get emails every day. We get letters in the mail. Not every day, but almost every day. We hear from people who love what we're doing. What people don't understand is that it's sort of expensive to produce a television show like this. It doesn't require earth-shattering funds, funds, but it, it does require financial help. So I am asking you, if you enjoy this program, throw us a 10 or a $20 bill every once in a while, or even a 50 or a $100 check. You see the address there on the screen. Your gifts are not tax deductible, by the way, because we want to be able to say what we want to say regarding politics without the IRS telling us no. So if you like the program, I ask for your support. If you've been watching the DNC convention, you might have heard the phrase that Michelle Obama is, and I quote, the most popular Democrat alive. <laughs> it's probably true. If you watch this show, I've been saying, who do the Democrats have? You know, they picked Senator Kane. Who knows this man? Does he inspire anybody? I don't think so. But Michelle Obama, for the most part, has stayed above all of the, the fray, and she delivered a home run speech. I don't agree with the message of it, but it was a home run speech. It was the right tone. It was the right rhetoric. And if that speech could be played a lot between now and election day, Hillary would have a chance of winning. You watch another section of the speech. You judge for yourself. I want a president with a record of public service, someone whose life's work shows our children that we don't chase fame and fortune for ourselves. We fight to give everyone a chance to succeed. And, and we give back even when we're struggling ourselves because we know that there is always someone worse off. And there, but for the grace of God, go I. I want a president who will teach our children that everyone in this country matters. A president who truly believes in the vision that our founders put forth all those years ago, that we are all created equal, each a beloved part of the great American story. And when crisis hits, we don't turn against each other. No, we, we listen to each other. We lean on each other because we are always stronger together. And I am here tonight because I know that that is the kind of president that Hillary Clinton will be. And that's why in this election, I'm with her. about one thing and one thing only. It's about leaving something better for our kids. That's how we've always moved this country forward, by all of us coming together on behalf of our children. Folks who volunteer to coach that team, to teach that Sunday school class, because they know it takes a village. Heroes of every color and creed who wear the uniform and risk their lives to keep passing down those blessings of liberty. Police officers and the protesters in Dallas who all desperately want to keep our children safe. People who lined up in Orlando to donate blood because it could have been their son, their daughter in that club. Leaders like Tim Kaine. <laughs> who, show, who show our kids what decency and devotion look like. Leaders like Hillary Clinton, who has the guts and the grace to keep coming back and putting those cracks in that highest and hardest glass ceiling until she finally breaks through, lifting all of us along with her. That is the story of this country, the story that has brought me to this stage tonight. 
the story of generations of people who felt the lash of bondage, the shame of servitude, the sting of segregation, but who kept on striving and hoping and doing what needed to be done so that today I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. And, and, and I watch my daughters Two beautiful, intelligent black young women playing with their dogs on the White House lawn. And, be and because of Hillary Clinton, my daughters and all our sons and daughters now take for granted that a woman can be President of the United States. You see, herein lies the problem, friends. You can be super articulate, super attractive, and be promoting something or someone like Hillary that is really, really unethical. I'll be right back. We're going to play the rest of Michelle Obama's speech. Don't go away. I want to invite you to go to our website. Almost every book that I have ever written is available as a PDF online for free. We have a ton of products, training materials, tools that are available for you for free. All we ask for is that you give us your email address. That's it. So that we can stay in touch with you and yes, from time to time, ask you to support this work. So. I'm inviting you, go to the, the website. Now, for those of you who say, well, I, I don't want a PDF, I want a real book. You can get one of my books. All you have to do is pay for shipping and handling and then give whatever gift you want. And if you can't afford anything, we'll send you the book for free. Just pay shipping and handling. Why are we doing all this? Because we want to change the direction of the country and we need to raise up a fresh generation of warriors to do that. That's why we have this tool. I invite you, go to the website, see for yourself. Welcome back, friend. I'm Randall Terry. There are some people who are saying, Randall, what in the world are you playing Obama or Michelle Obama's speech for? Because I committed to do that. I want you to see what we are dealing with, okay? To learn their rhetoric, to understand how they are going to try and win this election. So if you don't want Hillary Clinton to be elected, well, you better know what they're saying so that you can combat it. And remember this before we go to this clip. We have elections so that we don't have wars, okay? The, pre the peaceful transition of government is what you have so that you don't have civil war, killings, disappearances, imprisonments, torture. So watch Michelle Obama's speech and don't complain that I'm torturing you. Don't let anyone ever tell you that this country isn't great. That somehow we need to make it great again. Because this right now is the greatest country on earth. And as my, my daughters prepare to set out into the world, I want a leader who is worthy of that truth a leader who is worthy of my girl's promise and all our kids' promise, a leader who will be guided every day by the love and hope and impossibly big dreams that we all have for our children. So in this election, we cannot sit back and hope that everything works out for the best. We cannot afford to be tired or frustrated or cynical. No, hear me. Between now and November, we need to do what we did eight years ago and four years ago. We need, 
to knock on every door. We need to get out every vote. We need to pour every last ounce of our passion and our strength and our love for this country into electing Hillary Clinton as President of the United States of America. So let's get to work. Thank you all. And God bless. All right, friend, I'm out of time. We'll be back tomorrow night. Good to have you. God bless you.